Now in Araby, the unnamed narrator of the story relates the memory of his first love and a rather simple quest he sets off on to win her affections. His quest starts when he sees the sister of one of his friends standing on the porch in their neighborhood's quiet street. The narrator has secretly held affection for the girl, and since they are neighbors, he would watch her from afar. Being a shy boy, he dares not speak to her and only professes his love for her in his heart. The day she speaks to him is like a knight receiving a call from a goddess. She simply asks him if he is going to Araby, a splendid bazaar, and mentions that she cannot go because she has a church trip that day. Like a knight before the queen, the narrator promises to bring her back something from the Eastern style fair. The rest of the day, he cannot sleep, eat, or study without thinking about her or the promise he made. He asks his aunt and uncle for permission to go to the bazaar, which they give, and the rest of the day passes in a blur until he returns from school. The only problem is he has to wait for his uncle to return from work to get money to buy his promised gift, and his uncle is late. As the evening wears on without any sign of his uncle, the boy endures a torture befitting a questing knight. And he may not even make it to the bazaar before it closes. His uncle finally returns. He had forgotten his promise and begrudgingly gives the boy some money. Racing all the way to the fair, the boy finds himself in a labyrinth of shops. Walking around in such a strange world, he is entranced by the people and the wares. His heart sinks when he realizes the great worth of treasure in the stalls. Before he reaches the middle of the market, the lights go out as the shops close for the night. The story ends with the narrator recognizing his failure in the quest through grief and irritation. Joseph Campbell's hero's journey is also known as the monomyth in comparative mythology. The hero's journey is the common template of stories that involve a hero who goes on an adventure, is victorious in a decisive crisis, and comes home changed or transformed. Influenced by Carl Jung's analytical psychology, Joseph Campbell used the monomyth to deconstruct and compare religions. In his famous book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, he describes the narrative pattern as follows. A hero ventures forth from the world of common day into a region of supernatural wonder. Fabulous forces are there encountered and a decisive victory is won. The hero comes back from this mysterious adventure with the power to bestow boons on his fellow man. This is the romantic version of fiction. However, stories of the 20th century were more naturalistic, meaning that science and social circumstances affected people's of actions and behaviors. James Joyce embraced this idea in Araby, a naturalistic story with a romantic title. To understand this, let's look at how the first half of the story focuses on the romantic, therefore childish, version of the hero's journey, while the second half of the story reveals the naturalistic, therefore adult version of the hero's journey. The hero's journey is usually made up of three parts, the departure, the initiation, and the return. However, in both the romantic and the naturalistic stories, there is no return. Why? Well, the answer is found in naturalism. I'll explain. All heroic stories start in a normal environment. Not much is happening, and the protagonist is not a hero yet. Our narrator is a typical schoolboy in a typical house on a quiet street. Then he receives his romantic call to adventure from a priest who had died in the back drawing room of their house. The former tenant of our house, a priest, had died in the back drawing room. Air, musty from having been long enclosed, hung in all the rooms, and the waste room behind the kitchen was littered with old useless papers. Among these I found a few paper-covered books, the pages of which were curled and damp. The Abbot by Walter Scott, The Devout Communicant, and The Memoirs of Vidoc. Sir Walter Scott's The Abbot is a book about a boy who has adventures and falls in love with the Queen's servant. And there's another book about Vidoc, who is the first private detective who inspired later detective stories.
Such stories are inspiration for the narrator. He spends his winters running through the streets where we ran the gauntlet of the rough tribes from the cottages to the back doors of the dark dripping gardens. His uncle fills in the role of the monster or ogre that stands guard before the princess. If my uncle was seen turning the corner, we hid in the shadow until we had seen him safely housed. Then he sees the princess. Or if Mangan's sister came out on the doorstep to call her brother into his tea, we watched her from our shadow peer up and down the street. We left our shadow and walked up to Mangan's step recitedly. She was waiting for us, her figure defined by the light from the half open door. I stood by the railings looking at her. Her dress swung as she moved her body and the soft rope of her hair tossed from side to side. He does what he can to be the champion for his princess, even if he is too shy to confront her directly. Every morning I lay on the floor in the front parlor watching her door. The blind was pulled down to within an inch of the sash so that I could not be seen. When she came out on the doorstep, my heart leaped. I ran to the hall, seized my books and followed her. I had never spoken to her except for a few casual words and yet her name was like a summons to all my foolish blood. He must test his knighthood to be worthy of his princess. Her image accompanied me even in places the most hostile to romance. On Saturday evenings when my aunt went marketing, I had to go carry some of the parcels. We walked through the flaring streets, jostled by drunken men and bargaining women amid the curses of laborers, the shrill litanies of shop boys who stood on guard by the barrels of pig's cheeks, the nasal chanting of street singers who sang a Come All You About O'Donovan Rosa or a ballad about the troubles in our native land. These noises converged in a single sensation of life for me. When he feels overwhelmed by the environment and people around him, he receives a supernatural aid to deliver him from his trials, a chalice. I imagined that I bore my chalice safely through the throngs of foes. Her name sprang to my lips at moments in strange prayers and praises, which I myself did not understand. My eyes were open full of tears. I could not tell why. And at times a flood from my heart seemed to pour itself out into my bosom. I thought little of the future. I did not know whether I would ever speak to her or not. Or if I spoke to her, how could I tell her of my confused adoration? But my body was like a harp and her words and gestures were like fingers running upon the wires. There comes a time when the hero must enter the belly of the whale. This is the darkness that truly tests the hero. Sometimes the hero dies. Other times he's injured terribly. In all cases, the hero is able to return a changed person. The boy enters the darkness of his quest. One evening, I went into the dark drawing room in which the priest had died. It was a dark, rainy evening, and there was no sound in the house. Through one of the broken panes, I heard the rain impinge upon the earth, the fine incessant needles of water playing in the sodden beds. Some distant lamp or lighted window gleamed below me. I was thankful that I could see so little. All my senses seemed to desire to veil themselves and, feeling that I was about to slip from them, I pressed the palms of my hands together until they trembled, murmuring, O oh love, O oh love, many times. It is like death for him. The only thing that saves him is his memory of Mangan's sister. Then she appears before him and addresses him for the first time. The fantasy quest has been shattered and he must now enter reality. At last she spoke to me. When she addressed the first words to me, I was so confused that I did not know what to answer. She asked me, was I going to Araby? I forgot whether I answered yes or no. It would be a splendid bazaar. She said she would love to go. The princess is the one who gives the call to adventure. The boy accepts without thinking, not realizing that he has agreed to do so. And why can't you? I asked. While she spoke, she turned a silver bracelet round and round her wrist. She could not go, she said, because there would be a retreat that week in her convent. 
During this time, her brother and other boys are fighting or jousting, something the narrator used to do, but he does not do so now. Her brother and two older boys were fighting for their caps, and I was alone at the railings. She held one of the spikes, bowing her head towards me. The light from the lamp opposite our door caught the white curve of her neck, lit up her hair that rested there and, falling, lit up the hand upon the railing. It fell over one side of her dress and caught the white border of a petticoat, just visible as she stood at ease. It's well for you, she said. If I go, I said, I will bring you something. She is just as beautiful in reality as she is in fantasy. He accepts the call. Now, when a knight accepts a quest, he goes on many adventures and is tested as a knight. In reality, the boy is not met by any adventures, but by a foolish daily routine that keeps him from reaching his goal of Araby. What innumerable follies laid waste my waking and sleeping thoughts after that evening. I wished to annihilate the tedious intervening days. I chafed against the work of school. At night in my bedroom and by day in the classroom, her image came between me and the page I strove to read. The syllables of the word Araby were called to me through the silence in which my soul luxuriated and cast an Eastern enchantment over me. Saturday arrives and he waits some more. Sometimes the night enters a wasteland that nearly kills him. The boy's wasteland is another matter. It is his own house. When I came home to dinner, my uncle had not yet been home. Still, it was early. I sat staring at the clock for some time and when its ticking began to irritate me, I left the room. I mounted the staircase and gained the upper part of the house. The high, cold, empty, gloomy rooms liberated me, and I went from room to room singing. From the front window, I saw my companions playing below in the street. Their cries reached me, weakened and indistinct, and, leaning my forehead against the cool glass, I looked over at the dark house where she lived. Notice he is isolated from his friends. The time has come to leave the wasteland and go to Araby. Except like all goals, it is guarded and the hero must confront and defeat the guardians. First, Mrs. Mercer, the gossiper. When I came downstairs again, I found Mrs. Mercer sitting at the fire. She was an old garrulous woman, a pawnbroker's widow who collected used stamps for some pious purpose. I had to endure the gossip of the tea table. Second, his uncle who arrives late at 9 p.m. and begrudgingly gives him a florin, which is a just reward for defeating the guardians. The boy races to Araby. Instead of a chalice as his talisman of protection, he carries the florin coin his uncle gave him. I held the florin tightly in my hand as I strode down Buckingham Street towards the station. The sight of the streets thronged with buyers and glaring with gas recalled to me the purpose of my journey. The boy is now ready to depart the wasteland. Out of the wasteland, the hero must enter the belly of the whale. In reality, it is a third class carriage of a deserted train. It crept onward among ruinous houses and over the twinkling river. At Westland Row Station, a crowd of people pressed to the carriage doors but the porters moved them back, saying that it was a special train for the bazaar. I remained alone in the bare carriage. In a few minutes, the train drew up beside an improvised wooden platform. I passed out onto the road and saw by the lighted dial of the clock that it was 10 minutes to 10. It is a dark and strange ride, and only one used for those going to Araby. This is similar to the heroes crossing the river Styx by Chiron's boat to enter the underworld. Then the boy arrives to the mysterious world of Araby. In front of me was a large building which displayed the magical name. Having succeeded in arriving to his destination, the hero must still face the road of trials for his initiation into manhood or into a hero. I passed in quickly through the turnstile handing a shilling to the wary looking man. I found myself in a big hall girded at half its height by a gallery. Nearly all the stalls were closed and the greater part of the hall was in darkness. 
I recognized a silence like that which pervades a church after a service. I walked into the center of the bazaar timidly. A few people were gathered about the stalls, which were still open. Before a curtain, over which the words Café Chantant were written in colored lamps, two men were counting money on a salver. I listened to the fall of the coins. The sights and sounds cause him to forget his mission. It is with heroic qualities that the boy remembers why he is there. Remembering with difficulty why I had come, I went over to one of the stalls and examined porcelain vases and flowered tea sets. How much is this going to cost him? Like Odysseus on his 10 year journey home, the boy is delayed further by meeting the goddess. Only in reality, the goddess is a young woman wishing the store will close. At the door of the stall, a young lady was talking and laughing with two young gentlemen. Observing me, the young lady came over and asked me, did I wish to buy anything? The tone of her voice was not encouraging. She seemed to have spoken to me out of a sense of duty. In myths, women are temptresses, trying to stop the hero from achieving his goal. In reality, they, as everyone else, are merely a distraction. I lingered before her stall, though I knew my stay was useless, to make my interest in her wares seem more real. Like any knight, he is trying to be chivalrous or polite, which only leads to his own suffering. Having reached his goal, the knight usually defeats his enemy and becomes a greater person, a king or a god, and wins a prize to take back to his princess. In the natural world, however, there can only be disappointment. I heard a voice call from one end of the gallery that the light was out. The upper part of the hall was now completely dark. Thus the story ends. No prize, no gift for his princess, just failure. Gazing up into the darkness, I saw myself as a creature driven and derided by vanity, and my eyes burned with anguish and anger. But did he fail? Not if he learns a lesson. He actually has learned something about love and life that the old romances cannot teach. Vanity gets you nowhere. Fantasy and reality are two separate ideas. Araby was not a mysterious market full of wonder and spectacle. Instead, it was a shabby market full of overpriced goods and indifferent people. The narrator is not a knight on a quest, but a boy who foolishly lost an entire week of his life, missing out on all the fun his friends were having. Nothing about the week was real except his lesson and disappointment. The knight should slay a dragon and bring the treasure to the princess. Instead, the dragon simply was not there. Neither was the treasure. According to Joyce, the age of romance is dead. Naturalism reigns supreme in a modern world ruled by naturalism. This is why there is no return for our hero. The boy has not yet become a man. He has not put aside his romantic ideals, boyhood, for reality, adulthood. Sometimes failure is a lesson in itself and reality is full of disappointments. This is something we must get used to.